Good afternoon. Uh, my name's Ian Jones. I'm the chairman of WASA. I'm not quite sure. It's the Workers' Height Safety Association. We deal with anything to do with height safety. Um, I've been asked to give a talk on the topic of is your personal fall protection equipment fit for purpose? Uh, the general perception is that if your equipment has been inspected and it complies to the relevant performance standard, then that's generally enough. It's really not quite that simple. But um, if we start off with, is it fit, is a good starting point. Obviously, you've got to have an inspection regime, which consists of uh, user inspection, which should be done before the equipment is ever used. So every time the person comes to use it, they should be competent and know how to inspect their own equipment. A detailed inspection, which is uh, the phraseology they use sometimes for a competent person. The inspection a competent person does is exactly the same as the pre-use inspection. The only difference is they document it. So if the HSE come along, you can say, yes, this equipment's been checked on a regular basis. The time that you decide to check it, whether it's monthly, quarterly, annually, is really down to yourselves. It's your own responsibility and you have to define that as to how onerous the, wear, the work will be and how hard the wear will be on that particular type of equipment. They have a third one they call interim inspection. That's a bit vague, but what it means really is if you've uh, got equipment, it's going through your normal regime and something happens to it, um, it gets left outside when it shouldn't have been, something not too disastrous but somehow you need to just have another look at it and that's the definition of an interim inspection obviously your final thing harnesses lanyards you can't service them all you can do is inspect them because if you fall on a lanyard or a harness that's your lot you have to replace it but with fall arrest blocks more sort of engineering type equipment they need to be serviced usually annually if they're going to have more wear and tear than that, you can make it more often. Um, and that they have to be returned to the manufacturer or the service agent. So if you perform to those standards, then uh, you're doing okay with the inspection regime. The responsibility for making sure that all your equipment is correct lies with yourselves. It's not enough to just inspect them and then to have them you know, they're CE marked, because the way that you're going to use the equipment, you have to understand the hazards in the way that you're using it. So the actual jobs that you're doing, you have to look at them and you have to go through the usual stuff. You have to do a risk assessment. To carry out a risk assessment, you've, you've got to have some understanding in detail of the job you're doing. You have to understand how someone's going to get hurt, you have to understand the shortcomings of the equipment. You know, for the rest of equipment, like a lot of stuff, is designed to do pretty much one job. If you start being too flexible with it and start pushing it into areas where it's not designed, then you may have problems. The fact that it's got a C mark on it doesn't really help that much. All that is is a performance standard. So you must look at the hazards in detail. If you don't understand the hazards in detail, you should get someone in who does. So you've got to eliminate the hazards or at the very least mitigate. Mitigation is a, is a good word, what it means really. If someone's going to fall and the only thing you can do is stop them well enough so their feet hit the floor and the, the, the choice is, and this is where it comes down to you, you've got to be able to stand up in court and defend your actions. But if you can say, okay, this person is going to fall if we don't give them some sort of arrest equipment, they're going to land, break the back, break the neck, die. But we can introduce uh, equipment, and on some occasions they might hit the floor with the feet. That would be considered mitigation because you're reducing the, uh, the consequences of what goes on. It's a judgment call, and unfortunately the book stops with the, with the user. So... The person carrying out the work obviously has to be trained, they have to understand the equipment and they have to understand all the hazards. With a lot of people, you, you send people away and they get training on harnesses and they understand how to put it on. 
if then they go and do a specific job that has specific hazards, you, they have to be informed of it. You have to do a safe system of work. So you have to have a document that formulates what you're doing. The best thing is, there's a put here, is like I'm pretty boring. Written documents are even more boring. That's why visuals are much better. That's why stuff's up there. Because you'll be looking through me and after five minutes you're thinking, oh God, I can't hardly keep me, my eyes awake. You know, keep them open. You look at that, at least it's a bit of a change of scenery and you might actually read it. If you're doing a safe system of work, the best thing is put photographs in it. Because the best thing is if someone can point at something and go, oh yeah, I use that sort of kit. That's what I do, that's smashing. Also, if you've got a problem with language, people's language skills, they might be able to talk English well, but it doesn't mean they can read it very well or express themselves in the written word. So photographs are great. And it also, it's easier to do because you, you take a few photographs, you don't have to write so much. You know. um, the, if after reading the documentation supplied with the PPE, there's any doubt about it, you've got to consult the manufacturer. That's always your terms of reference. Always go back to them. And if the manufacturer's not giving you the answers, if they're not technically aware, if what they say to you sounds rubbish, go to a different manufacturer. Or even you can contact Waza. That was a bit of a sales pitch there, if you missed it. Um, they have got uh, technical guidance. If you email in, uh, someone with some sort of knowledge will get back to you. They'll phone you, they'll email you and they'll try and help you on your particular problem. Um, the manufacturer should know about the potential hazards of their own equipment and how not to use it. Because, you know, we, manufacturers, we've been making this stuff for years and we know the different and interesting ways people have found to use and misuse it. So, you know, we're a good, good place to come to. It'll tell you about the proper use of it. Oh yes, I forgot to put that in. Um, you've got technical guidance notes on the Waza website. That's not easy to say. Uh, and these will explain various facets of, of fall protection and height safety work. Again, a lot of it's general, but it does hit some topics. Um, and if, like I've said before, if they don't give you the information, then give us a buzz or email us. A good standard you should all have is 8437. It's a code of practice on selection and use and maintenance. It covers everything. If you look carefully, it covers risk assessment twice. So uh, you can tell it was a rush job, but obviously risk assessment is very important. Um, but all these standards are general. They've got to be, you know, they have to cover such a wide area, they can't be specific. So although that says it's codes of practice for selection and everything else, it's still being very general. They don't really advise on usage. The other thing with standards, they don't cover everything. You know, you, you, a manufacturer makes something new, there's no standard for it often, so how do you know the, it performs as it should and how do you know if it performs at all it's difficult standards can be withdrawn and that causes chaos because what happens is if they withdraw a standard the companies who already have the standard can keep uh, stamping it with a CE mark the new companies making new equipment which may be better can't stamp it with a CE mark because that CE doesn't exist but they don't take it off the existing companies with the existing standard. So this is where it gets a bit messy and you have to do a bit of, uh, bit of looking into it. You do have standards that aren't correct. Some of them basically are rubbish. Some of them have been badly written. Some of them are limited because the people who've written them on that committee have only had knowledge in a certain area and haven't had detailed knowledge in other areas. There's, uh, the standards on man riding winches and they're really not very good. There's, you know, the development of the product has gone so far beyond and the standards are reviewed once every five years. And if the person who knows about it misses the meeting, that's it for another five years. So you can end up with some rubbish out there. So you just, you know, you, it's all coming back to you. You've got to know your subject and you've got to know it in detail. The, uh, 
as it says at the beginning of all this sort of British and European standards, they specify requirements, test methods, instructions for use and marking. But what they're saying is it has to comply to a test method and it has to give, it's defined what, you, what the manufacturers have to write on the label and what we have to put in the instructions. But the test methods don't necessarily replicate how the equipment's going to be used. Because when you're designing a test, you want everything to fall within certain parameters so you can judge one thing against another. They, in theory, they cover lots of stuff, but it's, it's very theoretical. Um, I think I've said all that. Right, a standard may be interpreted differently by manufacturers, the health and safety executive, the testing centre, the quality auditor and the customer. We often get guys from the HSE going into customers and saying you can't use that because of this and actually their, their knowledge is limited because they have to know a lot of subjects and you can actually have a chat with them and dissuade them of their original opinion. It's like in um, there's, there's a thing in, in uh, height safety, uh, orthostatic intolerance or suspension trauma. Now, that has gone through the height safety industry like wildfire. All the manufacturers made bits of kit to stop it happening, everybody does it in training, and it doesn't actually exist. What happened was, the document was written about various things. This was part of it, and there was a comment put into a private document to say that this should be investigated further. But it got out into the industry and everybody started adhering to something that doesn't actually exist. There's no evidence, there's no proof that this exists at all. And the College of Surgeons actually came out and said, you're talking rubbish. Because when they do a tourniquet on a leg, when they're doing a, a proper job on it, it takes loads of force. They, it, they have to clamp both sides to stop the blood flowing. All we're doing with the harness is cutting in a little bit into your major muscle here, and then they have a leg up for four hours doing a knee operation, they release it and they have no problem. So they're saying, you're talking rubbish. And we're going, yeah, but we've made loads of stuff for this now. And they go, well, we're very sorry, it doesn't exist. But if you talk to a lot of people, everybody's still training to it. So this is what happens. And we're in the industry, we come out with this rubbish, so you have to have a lot of detailed knowledge. So. The manufacturer will have a practical and commercial considerations. The health and safety executive will look at legal, regulatory, and also they'll look at the family of standards as they've come down before, because they tend to come, one will follow another. The testing centre just does care about it conforming to the standard and not how it's used practically. The quality auditor will just look at consistency of production, because that's what the ISO uh, standard's all about. And the customer, well, it depends on your knowledge, really, doesn't it? So it's, uh, there's a lot of stuff in there that you've got to lose a bit of judgment. You take the height safety test for fall arrest blocks, what they do, they drop a 100 kilo solid mass, which is 15 stone 10. Now, a lot of people say, okay, so you can't use a harness if you're over 15 stone 10. If that was the case, I wouldn't be able to ever use harness because I haven't been 15 stone 10 since I was about 15 years of age. But you have to have these specific parameters in a test so you can judge things like fall distance, the force applied, and the, you have to use set weights. Some of it is a bit subjective. You've got to make judgment calls. The reason we use six kilonewtons as the force applied to the body is because they worked out a few years ago that parachutists took 12 kilonewtons when they jumped out of an aeroplane and the parachute opened. So we went, well, that's a good number. Tell you what, we'll half that, that'll do. And it's, it's, it's about that, using a bit of judgment. But for customers, anybody using this kit, try and get as much detailed knowledge as you can, and then you sort it going forward. I hope there's no questions. I'm sort of running out of stuff now. Anybody? Got anything to say? I'm getting waved off. I've had me five minutes. Thank you very much for your time. Found anything new from today's talk? Yes. What was it? Um, the stuff about suspension trauma, the fact that there is some controversy about it, because I think everybody um, who 
who goes on a training course is told suspension drums is a real problem and you need to learn how to deal with it. Um, and obviously if the Royal College of Surgeons have got doubts about it, then there's some, some issues there that need to be ironed out. So.